Let's get open our Bibles to, well, two places, Luke chapter 16 and uh, Revelation chapter 20. Luke 16 and Revelation 20. Okay, let's go to Luke 16 first and then Revelation chapter 20. And uh, this message kind of goes hand in hand with uh, what we heard on Wednesday night. Brother uh, Daku did a great job, didn't he? Yes. Thank the Lord, just did a super job. It stirred me up you know, about souls, and I appreciate that. God used him in a great way. And so I trust that, uh, I hope, and I'm praying that the Lord will do the same here tonight. Luke chapter 16, notice verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice there's a semicolon there. It's not a period. That's an important thing. He didn't just die and was buried. There's more to come. Verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Uh, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hold your hand here. We'll go right back to that. Luke chapter 20. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 20. And verse 15. Notice the Bible says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. It's a joy to be here tonight. It's a joy to open up your word. Lord, we know no matter what the circumstances are, where we are sitting, or how many are or are not here tonight, I do pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand that your word wants to do a work in our hearts. So I pray this evening that you'd fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. May your word go forth tonight with power and clarity and give us understanding as we uh, think about this thing, if you will, to come. Help me tonight, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. For some time now, we've been looking at the subject of a prophetic overview of the future. That's kind of what we've been dealing with. And we've been going through the major biblical events that God has promised would happen in the future. Not about you, I'm pretty glad that God has told us some things that are going to happen in the future. Isn't it nice that he doesn't just leave us in the dark wondering what's going to happen? By the way, that creates fear, does it not? The unknown, we call it the fear of the unknown. And I'm very glad that our God, in his grace and in his mercy, has revealed certain things to me and you about the future. And he has revealed these things, don't miss it, in his word that's where we find them. You know, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet was dealing with people who were worshiping false gods. And one of the things that Isaiah had reminded them of over and over is this, that it is only the true, the one true and living God who can tell us the future with 100% accuracy. Can I say that again? Uh, it's only the one true and living God who can tell us things of the future with 100% accuracy. 
Now hold your hand here and go back to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Let me show you a few verses as Isaiah was dealing with this very thing. Isaiah 42, notice verse 9 if you would. We read, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. That's to prove who he is. Who's, who's the only one that can do that? God himself. He says, I'm telling you things. I told you things before, and I'm telling you some new things, and they're going to come to pass. Look at Isaiah chapter 45, a few pages over in verse 21. We retell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Notice that statement. Who hath declared this, talking about the Lord, from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? He's saying, I told you about these things. Go over to Isaiah chapter 46, or look over there in verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Notice, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. I, God, am doing that. That's what he's saying. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here during his earthly ministry in John chapter 13 and verse 19, we read, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Want to prove God? Look at what he says is going to happen. If it happens, it's from God. Amen? 100% of the time. And accuracy. Acts 15, 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Aren't you glad of that? He tells us things. Now certainly God leads us to do things by his spirit, but don't miss this. The, uh, the only place that God reveals to us what is going to happen in the future is in his word. When the book of Revelation was complete, the canon of Scripture was closed. And uh, sorry, Mr. Charismatic, but all revelation from God has ceased as far as future revelation. Yes, he speaks to our heart, I understand that. But the canon of Scripture is, goal, uh, is closed. And by the way, God has a very good track record. Everything that God has said would happen thus far has happened, 100% of it. Which leads us, me and you, to conclude that everything that he says is still to happen will happen as well. And that's the proper conclusion. And you know, one of those things that God says is in the future is this. Eternity. We heard that word on Sunday night. Eternity. Now, again, what, uh, we've dealt with these things as you see on your sheet. We dealt with what happens. Take it chronologically. From here, the next event we have is the rapture. After the rapture takes place on earth, we have the tribulation. It's okay, you, a few of you can talk. There's only a few here anyway. All right, after that is the tribulation. And uh, in heaven is the judgment seat of Christ. Stay with me. I know you're here. Otherwise, I'll have to start all over again. All right, we're all here. All right, we're good. Uh, and then the second coming of Christ to earth. Oh, we're getting into it now. You want me to get done quick, amen? And then the millennium, and then the great white throne judgment, and then the next one, the destruction of heaven and earth, and then the very last thing, understand, the very last thing that God tells us about that's going to happen is in the future, it is absolutely certain that every single one of us will spend eternity somewhere. It's absolutely certain. There is beyond this world an eternity. And it is either heaven or the new Jerusalem or it's hell or the lake of fire. There are no other possibilities. None. So tonight I'd like to preach on this subject. An eternity in hell. Lord willing, next week we'll deal with an eternity in heaven. I was going to do that tonight. But I said, let's get, the, let's get the ugly one out of the way, amen? An eternity in hell. Do you know when God created man, he created us in his image? 
Right? Genesis chapter 1, leaves verse 26. He made us a living soul. He made us, that means he made you and I, unlike plants, unlike animals, unlike the fish of the sea. He made us eternal beings. Every human being is going to live forever. And the person that does not receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior before they die, they will go to hell forever. Sad but true. But what is hell? Well, I hope you know it, but we'll say it anyway tonight. And what is it like? Let's look at that this evening. Notice number one, if you would, as we go right into our, our outline tonight. Notice number one, the definition of hell. It's interesting what people call hell today. They'll go through a trial and they'll say this, and excuse the way I say this. I hope you know I'm, I, the way I mean it. They'll say, I'm going through hell. Uh, they'll go through a divorce and they'll say, that was absolute hell. Uh, they'll go through uh, war, and by the way, that's a terrible thing, but they'll spend uh, maybe their World War II or, or whatever, the, uh, the Persian Gulf and all that, and they'll say, that was hell. But the truth of the matter is, as bad as those things are, and some of them are extremely bad, that none of them, none of them, none of them come close to hell. None of them do. You know the word hell is found in 54 verses of the Bible? 31 times in the Old Testament, first mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 22. 23 times in the New Testament, last mentioned in Revelation 20 and verse 14. The lake of fire is mentioned in four verses of the Bible. All of them in the New Testament book of Revelation, 19, 20, 2010, 2014, and 2015. And we know, we've talked about this before, that hell and the lake of fire are technically two different places. That hell is a temporary place uh, while the earth stands. It is a place of the lost dead until the time of the resurrection and the great white throne judgment. We know that it's located in the center of the earth. Hell is. From earth's perspective, hell is always described as down. Isaiah 14, 15. Ye, yet thou shalt be brought down uh, to hell to the sides of the pit. I've heard people say, we don't know where hell is. It's down. It's to the center of the earth. The Bible always says that. Uh, 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. And so we know hell is located in the center of the earth. And we know also as originally created by God for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. By contrast, a lake of fire is that eternal place, that eternal abode after the earth is destroyed. He death and hell deliver up the dead, according to Revelation chapter 20. And of course, uh, they're uh, the lost are then cast into the lake of fire. Uh, we understand that. And again, uh, uh, the lake of fire is the eternal place after the earth is destroyed. But both of them are essentially the same. And so for argument's sake, I'm just going to refer to them as hell tonight. I hope you don't mind that. But the English word hell is translated from the Hebrew word sheol. In the Old Testament, sometimes sheol is translated to mean the grave. It's translated to the English word grave, the, the place where the bodies of the dead are laid. Psalm 6, 5. For in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. That's the same word, sheol. Who shall give thee thanks? But other Old Testament, other times in the Old Testament and, and in every New Testament occurrence, the word is used for this. Here it is. Biblically defined, hell is the place of eternal punishment for those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It is a place of eternal punishment for those who reject Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to imagine this for a moment. There is a, a, a place, and I'm going to get into this here in a little bit, that God himself has created where mankind who rebel against God and die without the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they're going to dwell in this place forever. Two things to understand about hell. Letter A, write this down. It is a literal place. It's a literal place. Hell is not a state of mind. A hell is not an imaginary place, as some would purport, uh, made up by religious zealots to try and control men. 
It is not a mere condition of being separated from God. Hell is a real place. It is a literal place. Just like Dover, Delaware is a real place. Just like Athens, Greece is a real place. Sydney, Australia is a real place. Hell is a real, literal place that exists, whether someone wants to believe that or not. They say, well, I don't believe that. doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the Bible says. And it is described as a real, literal place. Look back in Luke chapter 16, in verse 28. We read, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, watch this, lest they also come, notice the phrase, into this place of torment. You say, preacher, I've never been there, and I've never talked to anyone who has been there, so how do I know that it exists? Well, first of all, you ought to thank God that you've never been there. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And if you're saved, you ought to thank God you're, you're never going to be there. But secondly, you've probably never seen Moscow. Maybe you have, but I haven't. Or Sydney, Australia. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's not about just what we see. And we know that it exists because God says it does. And then he says it is a literal place. So understand when we talk about hell, we're not talking about some figment of the imagination, not a mere different place than God is. We're talking about an actual place that God has created. But then it's also, letter B, it's an eternal place. Do you know once a person is in hell, there is no way for that person to get out of hell? No way. It is eternal. There are no second chances. There is no parole for good behavior. Uh, there is no end in sight. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no, if I just hang on for a little bit, this will end. There is no future to look forward to. It is absolutely eternal. It's crazy, isn't it, when you think about that? Not only that, that the, but the once available grace of God and the once available mercy of God and the once available free forgiveness of God that was offered during this lifetime is now gone forever, never to be available again. It's eternal. I hope you're still in Luke chapter 16. We're going to spend some time there. Listen to what the rich man who died without Christ said in Luke 16 and verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. God, help me send some relief down here. Do something to change this situation that I'm in. Notice verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside this, beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. There's no way out. You see, a person that goes to hell will be there. Forever. They're not annihilated. They don't burn to ashes or burn till they're gone. They're there forever. Do you know, I want you to think about that for a moment because if the following people I'm going to read here, uh, give you in a few moments here, didn't trust Christ as their Savior before they died, and it's assumed probably by most of us they didn't, I hope they did, they're still in hell today. Cain. Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, that murdered his brother Abel, that had sin right there, that sin offering, that would have atoned if he believed on the Lord and offered that, uh, that, that offering as representative of that. Uh, if he just did what God said, but no, he, he dug in, and he wanted to do it his way to bring his own works to God. Aren't those good enough? If he took that belief to the grave, let me tell you something, he's still in hell today. How about Esau, Jacob's brother? 
who is described in Hebrews chapter 12 as a fornicator, as a profane person, and is said to have found no place for repentance. Take his brother Esau. He's still in hell today. <coughs> Excuse me. How about Pharaoh? Pharaoh from Exodus chapters, well, 3 through 12 and on, uh, the one that Moses uh, stood before. Uh, do you remember his words uh, to Moses when he asked to let my people go uh, and to worship uh, uh, the Lord God of heaven? How he responded to that? He said, who is the Lord uh, should I, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. He's regretting that today. Because he's still in hell today. Oh, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed the Lord, he is still in hell today. I think of men like Voltaire, lived from 1694 to 1778. He was an outspoken atheist. They say he was a deist, but he said so many things uh, against the Word of God. He denied God, the God of the Bible. And he said that the Bible would be gone 100 years from his death. That's what he said. And he died without Christ, as far as we know. He's still in hell today. I think of Marilyn Murray O'Hare, 1919. Uh, she was born. She founded that organization, uh, American Atheist. Uh, uh, she made it her soapbox to deny God uh, and to be uh, a part of those that wanted prayer at a school and a Bible reading at a school. Uh, uh, if she died without Christ, she is still in hell to this day. And those and others are there. will never get out. Because hell's a real place, a literal place, and it's an eternal place. So we see the definition of hell. And then we see number two, the description of hell. What's it like? You see, preacher, we know this. There's a lot of people that don't. There's a lot of people that have different ideas about hell. What is it like? How does the Bible describe hell? Well, notice, first of all, letter A, it's a place of torment. Luke chapter 16 and verse 28. Notice we read, I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. Notice, lest they also come into this place of uh, torment. Luke chapter 16 and verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, what? Being in torment. And seeth Abraham afar off and, and Lazarus in his bosom. Here the rich man is crying out from hell as he's crying about, hey, it's a great time down here. Don't leave me alone. Everything's going well. That's not what he's saying. He's calling hell a place of torment. What a powerful word that is. You know, being torments means to be tortured. It means to be inflicted with extreme, excruciating pain. It means to be in the worst pain possible. The Bible often describes the fact that those people that are in hell uh, will be there weeping, or the phrase is a phrase, weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. Uh, can you imagine their teeth are just grinding together in pain that they cannot escape? It's a pain that never diminishes. It's a pain that never ceases. Matthew 14, uh, 13, 42 says this, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Do you know that hell is a punishment that is worse than a violent death? Think about the most violent death you can think of. Hell is worse. Because it's, an, it's a conscience, uh, conscious yet inescapable eternal torment in the flame of fire uh, where the pain is constant but the body is never consumed. It, it never goes away. Revelation 20.10 tells us that in hell where the beast and prophet are, those there shall be, quote, tormented day and night forever and ever. We could say forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You know, according to an article I found in Smithsonian Magazine, scientists study the core of the earth, and they said that there's new research that says, that has found that the center of the earth is as hot as the sun. 
You say 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, just to give you a little perspective, a blowtorch is 2,400 degrees. Putting your hand in the blowtorch, uh, they say that's 10,800 degrees. By the way, that's only a guess. I think it's hotter than that. I'll tell you why, because humans have only been able to drill just under eight miles into the crust of the earth, and the distance to the center of the earth is nearly 4,000 miles. So the truth of the matter is they don't have a clue. But what they do know is it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Can you imagine what it's like in that place? It's a place of torment. But that would be, it's also this. It's a place of remembrance and regret. Look at Luke chapter 16 and verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your, received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Again, the rich man was in hell. Notice, he remembers things as he's in that pain and torment. Uh, and what I mean by that is those in hell will remember their loved ones. They'll remember the life of ease. They enjoyed. You say, well, it's not, that, so not everybody has a life of ease. Compare it to hell, and it'll be a life of ease, no matter how much hardship you face on this earth. They'll remember the innumerable blessings that, that they took for granted. They'll even remember the tracks they rejected. They'll remember the invitations to church they declined. They'll remember the conversations with believers that they either ran from or, or cut short uh, or avoided about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll remember it forever and ever and ever. Imagine that thought going through their minds as they cry out in pain. Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I take that track? Why didn't I listen to that Christian I worked with? There's remembrance and regret in hell. And let us see, it's also a place of not only torment and remembrance and regret, it's a place of isolation. Do you know in hell you're isolated? Luke 16, 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Understand in hell this rich man was alone. There was no one there he could talk to. There was no one there he could find help from. Uh, uh, nobody there at all. There are no parties in hell. I get tired of hearing that, quite frankly. I'm going to my friends. We'll have a party down there. There are not parties in hell. Hell is not a brothel. A hell is not a place where you can experience all of your vile fantasies. That's not what hell is. In hell, you are all alone, burning forever there in torment. That's the reality of hell. You think this coronavirus has isolated us? Nothing compared to hell. All alone forever. Now, sometimes it's nice to be alone, to get your thoughts together, get a break from the kids, and have a break from all the commotion. But I tell you what, after a while, I get a little sick of it. I get tired of eating alone. I get tired of being alone. I, my wife goes somewhere, I want her back, you know. I don't enjoy any of that. I don't like being alone. But imagine being in hell alone, suffering. It's a place of isolation. And then under D, it's a place of darkness. You know, Jude says it this way. And by the way, there is a flame that they have found that is so hot that it's black. It's the hottest possible flame. Someone said, how can it be dark in hell when there's flames? That's how hot it is. Jude, verse, Jude verse 13 says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, uh, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know, there is no light in hell. It's black. They might like the dark. I don't like the dark. And I don't think any of us have, a, have experienced total darkness. Total darkness. You know, I said when your mind experiences total darkness for an extended period of time, that the brain actually starts to malfunction. You start to lose your mind. You first, they say, start exaggerating. The, the sounds you hear get exaggerated, any sounds that you hear. Then you go into full-blown hallucinations. 
And then eventually the person loses their mind. That's why when they torture people, they isolate them, they put them in the dark and have no light upon them. Why is that? It drives them crazy. That's what it's going to be like in hell. It's a terrible place. You know, sometimes I think, and I may be getting ahead of myself here tonight, I think we've become desensitized to just about everything. With all the media and the television and all the, the murders that we hear of and read about and see and all the gore that's available on YouTube to watch this. I remember years ago, this was when I was lost, one of the first really freaky shows like that that came out. There was a real life uh, people recording people dying. It was called Faces of Death. And it was, it was people showing people that, that caught them dying on video from an accident. I couldn't watch that thing. But I'll tell you what, today, just about everybody could watch it. In fact, people seek that sort of thing today because they've lost, they've lost their emotions and nothing stimulates us anymore. We hear about hell and we fall asleep. We hear about hell and we nod our head. We hear about hell and it doesn't move us. Do we understand what we're talking about here? We're talking about a human being for all eternity in a place that they will never get out of burning and not being consumed forever and ever and ever. It's sad. Anyone with an ounce of humanity in them would say that's sad for anybody. But that's what it is. So we see the definition of hell. We see the description of hell. Notice number three quickly, the deception of hell. You know what the devil likes to do? He likes to deceive people about hell. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What does the devil want to do? He wants to blind people to the gospel. And one of the things he does, he likes to cause people to make light of hell or describe it as something different or reform it, if you will, if you will. Do you know unregenerate man does not want to think about the hell that the Bible describes? They don't want to think about that. Don't tell me about that. Some say when you die to escape that thought or that truth, they say when you die, it's just over. I've asked people soul winning, you know, where you go when you die. And I've had it on several occasions, maybe two or three. Someone said, in the ground. I said, what about you? The real you. And they don't get that. They say, in the ground. It's over. It's not over. It's not, but that's what unregenerate man wants to do to cope with it. Others describe hell as a place of partying. Others refuse to believe that a loving God would send anyone to, to such a place. That's how unregenerate man deals, deals with the reality of hell. But you know, even religions, religious groups do the same type of thing. They don't want to admit to, or preach to the people about a, a real hell. You don't hear a lot of messages on hell. You, you don't. Perhaps not enough. But many uh, don't want to admit to, to the Bible truth of hell. And so what do they do? They ignore it or they change it. You know the Jehovah's Witnesses deny that there's a hell? They say it's just talking about the grave. But what about all this tormenting and burning we're talking about here in Luke chapter 16? The Catholics invented purgatory to take care of little sins and say that hell is really only for those people that do those really, really bad things. None of you, of course, would go there. Just the real bad people. And many Bible believers don't consider hell enough. We don't think about it enough. We don't dwell on it. Don't be deceived. Hell's a terrible, terrible, real place. Which leads me to number four, and that is this. Not only the definition of hell, the description of hell, the deception of hell, but what about the driving force of hell? You say, what do you mean by that? Why does God tell us about hell? Do you know that most of the New Testament is written to the believer? Think about it. You know, Romans was to believers. First, second Corinthians were the churches, believers. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. All the pastoral epistles were to preachers and the believers. First Thessalonians pre was to believers. All your Hebrews and, and James were, were written to groups of believers. And over and over he talks about hell. Why? We're not going there. Why should we even think about it? Why should we talk about it? Why should we consider it? Well, it's the same with anything else in the Bible. Why would God tell us uh, uh, about it? Uh, I'll tell you why. Because he wants it to be fruit producing knowledge. 
You see, we have all this knowledge, especially if you're in a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Boy, we're just filled with information. I mean, we know what we're supposed to do. But it's not good information unless it's fruit-producing information. We just take it in, nod our head, and go on our way. That's not what the Bible is designed for. It's designed to grip our hearts and cause us to move into action. And we ought to be concerned if we're not concerned. And it ought to move us if we're not moved. But God forbid we've gotten to the place where we've become so numb to everything that we're just waiting to get out. You know, hear it and get out. Say, I did my duty. You're missing it. You see, the truth about hell is supposed to do a couple things. Number one is this. Write this down, letter A. We should be glad that we're not going there. You ought to rejoice tonight. You know why? Because all of us deserve it. You see, we get convinced sometimes, well, that's just for the bad people. That's for those really, really, really bad people, you know. Uh, not so. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, imagine if uh, we could open up the coffers of your heart and see everything you've thought, everything you've done, everything I've thought, everything I've done, and see how good we are then. We'd all shrink in embarrassment. We ought to rejoice at the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to rejoice that he saved us. Amen. It ought to be the love of Christ that constraineth us. The fact that he loved me so much he died for me and put me in a ministry to serve him. Praise God for that. Psalm 107 verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, sometimes we come to church and we just open the hymn book, hymn book up and, you know, we just kind of just sit there and just kind of mumble the words with no emotion, just saying words, not even thinking about what we're singing. Something's wrong. Song service ought to stir us, remind us if we're redeemed, we ought to thank God that somebody reached us with the gospel. And then the second thing it ought to do, not only be glad that we're not going there, but be burdened for those who are. You lost your burden tonight? Have you allowed the unbelieving world to cause you to kind of fold up shop a little bit? You know? It was the last time you witnessed to somebody, handed out a tract to somebody, said something about the Lord. You see, if we truly believe there's a real, literal, eternal hell, it ought to burden us for the lost. And it ought to burden us not necessarily because of the lost, because that's what God cares for. That's what Christ cares for. We ought to love what He loves. And for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He wants every man to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. And Jude verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. He's saying, do something about it. Perhaps Romans chapter 9 is the most convicting passage I've read about somebody who's so burdened about the lost, so burdened above what I can even comprehend. I'm embarrassed to say so, but it's there. He talks about in verse 3, the apostle Paul, that I have, verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I'm so burdened about my brethren, uh, uh, those that, uh, uh, the Jews, that uh, my brethren in the flesh, uh, that I, I, I was willing to be accursed for them. I don't get that. It's above me. But it shouldn't be. Chapter 10 and verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Why? Notice, uh, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Are you burdened for the lost? I truly to this day don't believe, and I, and I won't until somebody convinces me otherwise, that the problems the lost people don't want to hear the gospel. Now, that may, be, that may be true in some cases, but it's not an across-the-board thing. I think the problem's us. Yeah. We're not giving it. You've heard it said before, the church has hurt the world far more than the world has hurt the church by not giving them the truth. <laughs> you know, if there's one thing this, this COVID-19 has taught us is this. Mankind is still afraid to die. 
afraid to die. That means something. It means that they're going to be searching for something. And it's the Lord that's the answer. The question is, will we give it to them? You see, folks, the very last thing that God tells us about in the future, the very last thing that he tells us about is eternity. He talks about an eternity in hell and an eternity in heaven. They're both real. May both of those truths do something to change our lives. But does it? I hope so. Let's pray.